The Denver Strangler was an unidentified serial killer active in Denver, Colorado between 1894 and 1903. In a span of just 10 weeks in 1894, he was linked to the murders of three women, all of whom were sex workers. The Strangler is also suspected in the unsolved 1898 murder of clairvoyant Julia Voigt and the 1903 murder of Mabel Brown, though these connections remain speculative. Lena Tapper, a French woman known for her unchaste reputation, previously lived in Fulda, Minnesota, and later in Huron Lake before relocating to Denver as the mistress of Richard Demandy. Both she and Demandy were members of a secret French society called the Macaros, or Les Cavaliers d'Amour, where Tapper served as a courtesan. On September 3, 1894, she was discovered strangled in her bed at her Market Street residence in Denver. Marie Contessoit, also a French woman with connections to the Macaros, lived with her lover, Tony Sanders. On the day of her murder, Sanders reportedly fell asleep reading a newspaper. The following day, Contessoit was found dead in her bed, strangled with a stout cord so tightly bound it left deep impressions and finger marks around her neck. Known to be relatively wealthy, Contessoit had only 75 cents on her person at the time of her death, leading authorities to suspect robbery as the motive. Five men were arrested in connection with her murder, including Richard Demedy, Tapper's former lover, who had allegedly made advances towards her. Two of the men, Antonio Santopetro and Emile Tamens, were released soon after due to lack of evidence. Santopetro, previously dismissed from the police force and working as a messenger, was reportedly favored by Contessoit. Tamens, Contessoit's cook, was described as jealous of Santopetro. Both men were in the house at the time of the murder, but claimed they heard no disturbances. Kiku Oyama, a 24-year-old Japanese immigrant, arrived in the U.S. through Chicago during the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, where she met Imi Oyama, a cook, and reportedly began a relationship with him. The two moved to Denver in November of the same year. Shortly before her murder, a police raid on local prostitution businesses led to the arrest of several of her associates. With assistance from a French saloon keeper, Oyama managed to secure their release, though the saloon keeper later demanded a financial reward for his help. This demand led to a heated argument between Oyama and the saloon keeper, and one of the released women later remarked that Kiku had made too much talk about him. On the evening of November 13th, Kiku was last seen alive. After a brief conversation with friends, she returned home, drew the curtains, and was thought to have gone to sleep. Immy, who had gone out for a walk, found her lying in bed upon his return with the towel tightly wrapped around her neck. She was still alive, but struggling to breathe, and although Immy quickly removed the towel, Kiku was on the brink of death. In a panic, he ran across the street to call for Hannah, another Japanese woman, attracting the attention of Officer Carberry. When they entered the room together, Kiku had already passed. Evidence suggested a violent struggle had taken place. The bedsheets were disheveled and stained with blood, a second damp towel lay on the washstand, and the room's drawers had been rifled through, likely in search of money. Keys to both the front and back doors were missing, and Kiku bore finger marks near her windpipe, along with a bruise on her forehead. It appeared she had been thrown onto her back and strangled with a towel. Imi Oyama and several Japanese women were briefly detained on suspicion but were soon released for lack of evidence. Julia Voigt, a clairvoyant and medium, resided in an apartment on Champa Street. During the initial wave of murders, she informed authorities that while in a trance, spirits had provided her with a description of the Denver Strangler. On October 7, 1898, Voigt was discovered dead in her apartment, laying on the floor with the towel tightly knotted around her neck. It is speculated that the Strangler either believed she genuinely knew something about him or was superstitious and decided to eliminate her to prevent exposure. In 1903, nine years after the initial murders, Mabel Brown was discovered dead in her Market Street home. Her hands were bound with a pair of suspenders, a handkerchief was placed in her mouth, and there were strangulation marks on her throat. As with previous victims, she was found lying on her bed. One of the main suspects in the case was a Frenchman named Richard Demedy, who lived with Lena Tapper and was also involved with the Macaroos. Although only charged in connection with Tapper's death, 
Demody was seen as the most promising suspect for the series of strangulations, despite the evidence being circumstantial. News of his arrest stirred public interest, with the district attorney's office asserting they could prove he had, at the very least, strangled Tapper. Detectives even spent hours listening to the erratic claims of Demody's sister, Mi Fauchette, who was confined in the county's hospital for mental illness. Reportedly, Fauchette's mental state deteriorated after her brother's arrest and she claimed to see the ghost of his alleged victims, though it remains unclear if the prosecutor used any of her statements in the case. A total of 45 witnesses testified, including Laura Johnson, a woman with whom Demody was romantically involved, who was expected to deliver a sensational account against him. The prosecution also presented two alleged witnesses, a man and a woman, who claimed to have seen Tapper struggling with Demody through a window. Additionally, the prosecuting attorney suggested they had solid evidence, including a check supposedly written by Demody to bribe a judge for his release. Despite these efforts, the jury ultimately acquitted Demody of Tapper's murder. Following the trial, Demody relocated to Brazil. Frank Rock, a married French-Canadian laborer residing near Market Street, was arrested after authorities discovered he resembled a man seen fleeing the scene shortly after Kiku Oyama's death. Rock was also found to have previous connections with the Macaros. However, police soon concluded that while he might have known something about the murders, he was almost certainly not the killer. After a few days in custody without any confession or further evidence, Rock was released. On November 18, 1894, an Italian man known only as H. Meller entered Marie Vandress's home. Following an argument, he began strangling her, gripping her so tightly that she couldn't make a sound. Summoning her strength, Vendress managed to break free and scream for help. When an officer arrived, Meller was poised to cut her throat with a razor. Despite the violent incident, Police Chief Armstrong and other officers doubted Meller was the strangler regarding him instead as simply a man with a violent temper. Victor Monchereau, a roughly 40-year-old French carpenter with unusually large hands, first attracted police attention when his former friend, Alphonse Lemaire, shared a story implicating him in the murders. Lemaire, intoxicated, had wandered into a saloon owned by Frank Klepfel and sat quietly observing a billiards game. Tony Sanders, the lover of Marie Contessoit and present at the time, noticed Lemaire's interest in a conversation about the stranglings. When Lemaire finally joined the conversation, he asked if Sanders spoke French. Sensing a potential lead, Sanders listened closely as Lemaire claimed that neither Charles Chalou nor any Italian was responsible, but instead a man he knew well. With Klepfel and other patrons intrigued, Lemaire drank more, eventually naming the alleged killer Victor Monchereau. Lemaire, further inebriated, described Monchereau as a violent character whom he had met while they both served time at San Quentin Prison in California. Monchereau had arrived in Denver in 1893, and Lemaire followed just months before the murders began. According to Lemaire, Monchereau used chloroform to incapacitate his victims before strangling them and robbing them of their money. He also reportedly planned to murder another woman, Xavier, by using a plank to enter her backyard undetected. However, Monchereau fled when he heard footsteps in the alley. Though shaken, Xavier did not report the incident to the police. Despite the sensational nature of Alphonse Lemaire's account, authorities were skeptical, particularly after Victor Monchereau later accused Lemaire of being the strangler, offering a similar story. Although the police believed that neither man was responsible for the murders and regarded them as pawns of the Macaro, they briefly entertained the possibility that Lemaire himself might be the actual killer. According to Monchereau, Lemaire, who was originally named Charles Guichard, arrived in Denver from Salt Lake City. After meeting Monchereau in prison, he traveled to Denver in search of work as a watchman. Following Lemaire's drunken confession, he was arrested by Tony Sanders, and Monchereau was apprehended soon after. In prison, Monchereau alleged that it was Lemaire who had killed the women using chloroform and a towel to rob them. Monchereau's claims were partially supported by J.W. Williams, a black hod carrier who happened to overhear a conversation between the two men on Market Street. Williams reported hearing one of them say, I did it, although he couldn't identify who made the statement. Monchereau continued to assert that after each murder, Lemaire would come to him boasting about another job. 
Following the murder of Contessoy, Montero alleged that Lemaire disposed of chloroform and any other items that might raise suspicion against him. Two days after Kiku Oyama's murder, they met one last time, during which Lemaire reportedly confessed to killing all the women and expressed his intention to kill again, stating he preferred to do his work clean. Despite this, and numerous arrests, no one was ever convicted for these crimes. <laughs>